Uh, it is a special privilege for me to introduce uh, Sudhir. So, I am closely working with Sudhir uh, for a social collaboration initiative for our uh, testing services initiative. The only one thing which I want to uh, share about Sudhir is uh, he is one of the uh, inspiring personalities in the testing services where we can learn a lot uh, how to connect with everyone. So, that is the one greatest asset which I have learned from Sudhir is how to connect with everyone. So, uh, I, I have a lot of things to share, but uh, interest of time, I am just uh, requesting Sudhir to come and have the delivery. Thank you, Devakar. Um, actually, it is it's my privilege to be here. I have seen such wonderful speakers speak that uh, I am not sure I am going to do complete justice, so you will have to bear with me. But uh, thank you, Devakar and Sram Swami, thank you very much for this opportunity to speak here. So, um, I am going to talk about communicating across a cultural divide, but first, let us start with a small video. I will just put this here, it is okay. Yeah. It is called Murphy's Law. Whenever you try to get it out, it won't come out. short video just to illustrate the importance of understanding other cultures. And I'll just use this, that's fine. So, uh, how many of you this, this sounds like I'm having a coke from a, from a glass of. Never mind. <laughs> how, how many of you have actually seen Lost in Translation? I'm sure many of you would have seen it, and um, you know, uh, I, I saw it too a uh, long time ago. And my journey with with this culture started um, in 1993. Until 1993, I, I was just an ignorant person, someone who was used to being in India, being at home. Um, but an event transformed my life there. I joined a company called SR Information Technology and, and they gave me a choice. They said, do you want to go down the financial line or do you want to go down the engineering line? And they said, engineering. And they put me on a ship. So, on September 19, 1993, I left the shores of India here at Jamnagar, sailed up to the Persian Gulf, to the Kerg Island, loaded up oil, came down, went through the Suez Canal, the Red Sea, the Suez Canal, up to Turkey, unloaded, came back all the way to uh, Algeria, through the Straits of Gibraltar, up to Canada, through the Cabot Straits, on the St. Lawrence River, to Quebec. And when I, you know, went down this road, I got this opportunity to get off and meet with people. It was the first time I was actually getting out of India in the first place and, and meeting with people. And you know, when, when you live your life, there are certain stereotypes. You get used to certain things. And I think that was the first time I was being exposed to a lot of things that, that actually I didn't understand. Right? So from, from then, then onwards, we made about 14 transatlantic trips, but that's a story for another day. But that was the start of my journey in the, in the cultural circle. So, 
Since then, um, by um, and, uh, and I joined Cognizant in 1995, I've, I've traveled across the world courtesy Cognizant, uh, worked with, um, you know, worked in the US, worked in UK, uh, and the latest one being France, uh, I worked in Singapore as well, Hong Kong for a short period, and, and uh, the Netherlands. Latest one being France, so I will take a lot of examples uh, with, with Europe because of the cultural differences. So, I, I'm, I'm many of you have a lot of experience working with clients outside of India, so this may seem pretty straightforward to you. Uh, but for the, for the younger ones, you're a man who is part of a project in Chennai with a French team. You're working with a young French lady. And uh, one fine day, this lady gets a chance to come down to Chennai. And once she sees you, she's excited, rushes out, and this is what happens. Okay, so uh, a big kiss on both cheeks. And this actually happened in our campus. Okay, this happened to a person in our campus. This is not the guy, so don't try to look for him. <laughs> but it happened. Um, it also happened at lunch hour in the reception of the building when lots of people were going out to lunch and believe me people turned around and said okay can we all queue up to greet her <laughs> she didn't realize I don't think she quite realized the stir she was creating but she she did create a stir and she you know, for her it was perfectly normal to come and greet somebody like this and the young man turned beetroot red both cheeks. He could have been in a cold place. So, this, this kind of exemplifies the differences in culture that we will tend to encounter. So, here are some quick examples. If someone said, I don't care what you think, our first impulse would be to say, oh my God, this person doesn't care about me. Now, if the person was an Indian, he would say, there is something seriously wrong. But if the person who is saying is an American, that is as simple as saying, I don't mind what you think. Very, very, very simple. There is a difference in the way it is being interpreted. I don't care in the American way is I don't mind. Whereas in India, I don't care. Get out of my sight. I mean, I'm not saying that to Gopal, but you need him here. Or different ways of greeting. Uh, that's, that's, you know, that's Yura Singh. There are different ways of greeting around the world. People shake hands. Uh, they do a high fi They do a namaste. They do a adam. Uh, they rub noses. Eskimos rub noses. But when you come down to greeting, if you take the greeting which involves shaking hands, that has different connotations around the world. If you go to the western world, if you shake to, to be seen as a very strong person, one has to shake your hands, grip it hard, so that the person opposite you says, oh my god, he's killing me. <laughs> right. But anywhere, in, if, if you go to the African countries, that is not considered to be a good handshake. In African countries, it's a dead fish handshake. It's like holding your dead fish. It's a very limp handshake. In some countries, handshakes are all about um, doing business. Turkey, it's about doing business. India, right? In, in some parts of India, they put a towel over your hand and then there's money which goes under, it goes left and right. I don't know what they do under the towel, but Something happens there and they exchange money. So business happens. Crossing the road. There are different, you know, different countries have different ways of doing it. Here we don't wait for the zebra crossing. We, we just run across the road and to help with the, the vehicle. He can take care of himself. Uh, in, in the US, it's, it's very difficult. Most people don't walk. So sometimes in, in the bigger cities in New York, they will have these zebra crossings. but Otherwise, that's, um, you just have to your own devices. In Europe, right, in Germany, 
uh, and in the UK, uh, they, they obey it quite a bit. But, but in Germany, if you go up to a pedestrian crossing, and, and I tried this, if I try to cross when the light is red, I'm actually stopped by my fellow pedestrians. They say, oh, no, 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 you can't cross. The Germans, the Germans, you can't cross. So they are very, very strict about that. In France and Italy, it's like India. You can run across the road. The only thing about France and Italy is, if you want to be run over very quickly, please cross the road in France, in Paris. You can be run over like that. People don't wait for you. Okay, no one stops. So if you are crossing the road when the light is red, well, you do it at your own risk. Saying yes. It's a very famous example. I don't have to go into that. Everyone knows how the Indians say yes. Uh-huh. And instead of the shake. So there are differences um, in the way the culture works. So there's a gentleman called Professor Giard Hofstetter from uh, you know, Netherlands who came up with uh, an analysis of cultures. So he came up with about five parameters. And he said, if you look at an organizational or uh, national view of countries, there's one which is called a power distance index. That is, how equal are people? So in, in a culture, if it, the more hierarchical it is, the more the power distance is. So countries like Japan would be, you know, they would have a higher power distance index. Or individualism versus, you know, collectivism, which is how, how are people, when you look at nations, are they more individual or are they more collective? Do they work in groups? And the Western countries are more you know, individual compared to the Asian ones. Or masculinity, right? Masculinity is about equality of sexes. Which countries actually give equality uh, to sexes and have a, or which ones have a femininity in their character? And then some of the results would actually surprise you. And uncertainty avoidance index. Which cultures can deal with ambiguity versus those who say everything has to be written down in stone before I do something. And long term orientation, who looks forward to, you know, five years down the line, ten years down the line versus, okay, I have to live for today. So here are some examples of the Hofstede model where the comparison is between the United States, India and France there and the US, Argentina and Japan there. So what strikes you here? What, what are the things that strike you? PDI is power distance, IDV is individualism, MAS is masculinity, UAI is uncertainty avoidance, and LTO is long-term orientation. Some of, some of the results are pretty good, easy to look at. But if you look at surprising one, masculinity, look at France. One more thing, being a Western country, they would put masculinity above, but actually, they're not. They're right below India. So there is a feminine side to their character, right? Um, they, they, compared to the Germans, who, who would be more very masculine in their approach. Or uh, even India, for that matter, which is greater than France. It is for uh, France, right? Uncertainty avoidance. It is. It is quite high. So, so this is what Professor Giard Hofstede says, and that's that's the website. So you can go. You can actually go there. They have, um, uh, you know, they have a place where you can actually compare this. So this is from there. Uh, you can do a comparison of any three countries for all, most of the countries around the world. So, if you have any questions, any, anything here before I move on? So, 
when it came to you know working with people uh, some of the things i realized is that we need to understand each other and to understand each other there are several parameters we need to connect emotionally with people so when you when when i travel to other countries i i and uh, work for a long period of time i try to spend some time working trying to understand people maybe even speak the language so one of the first things is about understanding each other is a knowledge of the language now if even if we can pick up a little bit and speak to people they feel happy about it that they are speaking to people now when i went to france uh, france is a country which is renowned for not speaking english so if you go there and you have to ask for directions and you ask in english he said no 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 english no angle so you know you go back there what do you do so i, I took a two month course in french so i went back there with a vengeance and when i got lost i went and asked him in french i asked him in french twice and he said okay you you are lost you want to know the directions right <laughs> he said that in english i said yes i think what happened there was he concluded that he could speak better english than my french <laughs> so i said okay stop murdering the language <laughs> and so he, he said okay I'll, i'll just help you in english then um, understanding the nuances every every country has the ways of pronouncing words for uh, including the uk uh, considering that the uk is the home of english one would tend to think that um it is pretty straightforward but this in the beginning when i went to the uk i thought it was leicester it turns out that this is pronounced lester yeah uh, you wonder why why those two or three characters but then what's life without a little spice <laughs> t h a m e s i used to say thames thames and then someone says that is not thames it's temps so I, i thought temps was t e m s no 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 it's t h a m e s temps okay so the, then when i went to netherlands I, i heard a little story about a friend of mine uh, he he joined um, a, a company as a java programmer the first day he went to the cafeteria he met with the manager the dutch manager and she started speaking to him and um, she sat him down and said so do you know yafa he said hmm what what yafa i said no no i don't know yafa are you sure he said yes absolutely sure so after lunch she went back to the hr manager and complained this man has been recruited he doesn't know yafa it turns out that java is pronounced yafa in dutch j is always pronounced as y and v is pronounced as f and because he didn't know that he thought that was uh, you know an alien language <laughs> so and, and and french i used to pronounce as champs elises it turns out that chance elise no one ever pronounces anything the way they write it i don't know why they write it that way r o i s s y you would say it's roy c no it's not it's wasi god this should be straight forward right budapest it's not because they think it's a pest right it's not a pest is budapest you got to spit that out um i used to call it amsterdam it's amsterdam and it's pai so when we go to a country right uh, learning the local language is is a great thing if we can speak the way they do uh, then it's it's great because uh, when i went to the, to france and i wanted to go to the arc de triomphe uh, i wanted to go to the palace it's is written v e r s a i l l e s as versailles right that's what i said and the guy couldn't understand me he said where do you want to go again versailles we don't have that place i said hold on you have it right here 
Oh, you mean Vasai? Why do you write I L L E S? No, that's the way you write it. That's the way you pronounce it. Okay, so learning the, the language gets you wherever you want to go. Uh, speaking in the local lingo, boon or bane, uh, I, I talked about boon for us, bane for the locals. Most, most of the time, after two months, uh, I think they, many of them got pretty tired of me speaking French, so they spoke to me in English, so I achieved my objectives there. And, uh, you know, th this, this is um, something that we tend to think about. Uh, I used to think that the French were very, very uh, proud people. They didn't want to speak English uh, and so on. And, and they didn't want to speak English not because they don't want to do it, but it's because they don't want to make mistakes. And um, because the pride prevents them from doing something that is not perfect. But, and they won't do it to a complete stranger. Now, the moment we are able to connect emotionally with them, then they have no problems about speaking in English. But until then, uh, they will speak in French. They will not talk uh, to people. So, uh, one of my most important lessons was never underestimate other cultures. There is always a reason for what they are doing. And the reason is often something that we probably aren't aware of. Uh, understanding each other, cultures and, and way of doing business. Greeting. So, when I, when I went to France, um, it's, I, I used to get into the office and then everybody used to walk around greeting each other. And the greeting here was a, was a peck on the cheek, uh, both cheeks. It is said that uh, they could find out which region of France a person comes from by the number of times people kiss each other on the cheeks. Now, I haven't seen anything more than two on each, uh, but the market I've seen one go on for three, four, five times, but I left before they finished. <laughs> so, that's, and, and it's very important, they, they consider it an insult if you don't go in there and, and greet people. So, first thing, spend about 10 to 15 minutes walking around, you know, talking to people, meeting them, saying hello, and, and getting to know them, uh, asking them how they are in the morning. Meeting etiquette. Uh, meeting etiquette, uh, in, the, in, the, in the Western world, at least in the French world, uh, uh, American world, here it is Indian Standard Time, right? We can start any time, except this meeting, which always starts on time. Um, so, it, sorry, I couldn't resist that. Go on. So, uh, one of the things that happened in a French meeting was that there, there was a proposal meeting going on. Several vendors had come, the project manager was there one of the people was actually missing from it, from the meeting. And he rushed in about two minutes late. He was ordered to leave. He just said, go. And it was right in front of the vendors. And there was, there was no scope for mistakes. Yes, the meeting may take a little time to start once you get there, but the message was, be there on time. Start on time. But don't come two minutes, three minutes late. If, if you're going to be late, you know, if you, if you have a problem with that, start a little earlier. So it's, it is uh, always good to be on time. Um, American meetings have agendas. French meetings, most of the time, may not have agendas. They start with a topic and they discuss it to death. Sometimes you feel they're actually fighting inside the meeting room. They are not fighting. It's just their way of expressing themselves emotionally. And as far as hierarchy is concerned, if you look at an American kind of meeting, if the CIO says, this is a vendor we are going with, this is the business we are going to do, everybody accepts. With the French side, that's not a given. The CIO says, everybody goes with it, they say, yes, everybody goes with it, but we will still oppose you. And they will be allowed to voice their opinion, go back and discuss it. So when we, when we actually do business in Europe, we spend a lot more time, the sales cycle is a lot longer because of these conditions. Because people don't make a decision immediately, they want to uh, really do everything they can before getting out. But once you're in, then 
you know, they, you're trusted for life. Staying in the loop, it's uh, especially in, in French conditions, it's all about water cooler conversations, having coffee. You learn more over a cup of coffee than you would in a meeting room. People tend to loosen up over a cup of coffee. Uh, lunch is two hours. Right? Uh, you can either eat fast and then sit there and hear them talk or you can eat very slowly and then you can still hear them talk. So if you spend more time uh, with them, there's, you're bound to pick up a lot more information and do a lot more business. Like it's everything in the US happens in the golf course. Um, things like this happen over dinner, over lunch or, or at the coffee cooler. Employment rules, timings. Uh, people, you know, it's it's very uh, the employment rules are very very tough uh, in France. The employees are given a lot of importance. If you look at the U.S., um, U.S. is a, a hire and fire business. Uh, the U.K. is a little more uh, towards towards the employees. They have the tupe, which allows which which does not uh, allow uh, businesses to be handed over for outsourcing very easily. So, which you know, protects employees. Now, France is a little more stringent because they have trade unions who protect their employees. Germans, Germans are the toughest in this. There, the government protects the employees. So, we, we all work from nine to five or nine to six. If we work two more hours in Germany, people are not going to appreciate us for that. They will say, you know what, you are taking away two hours of work that somebody else could have done. So it's, it's not a case of, all right, wonderful, Gopal has worked two more hours, let's give him a bonus for that. And they'll actually take away your money and give it to somebody else. Right? Um, and getting people, you know, getting people in the European countries takes time. So this is, it's not a case of just in time. In, in, as, as in many other places, we can fire, we can hire people in India, we can hire people in the US, but in places like France and Germany, it takes anywhere between three months to nine months to get people, because the notice period itself is three months. So if we start, uh, you know, uh, if we start working with people, it, it takes quite an amount of time to get people on board. So look at, you know, working. So when, when you are in a foreign country, understanding the way people do business, the culture of the country is very, very important in order to be able to work with them. Okay, understanding each other. So, we go outside office. As Indians, a lot of time, you know, I've done that too, we tend to go and stay in a place where Indians stay. So there's a big contingent of Indians which goes to the market, comes back, goes to a Vijay movie, comes back, all in Paris, okay? But it doesn't work that way. We have to be able to work closely with them for a trust to come. So in my case, uh, I, I, I tend to play football. So I went uh, to, to the French, to my boss in France and said, I play football. So he said, yeah, why don't you come over for a game? We just don't have a goalkeeper. And that's the easiest position, right? You just have to stand there doing nothing. And I said, that's fine. So I go out to the ground and it's a French team. And he, he looks at me and they, all of them are French. They look at me and said, oh, Indians play football? I said, yeah, Indians play football. Um, so luckily enough, I don't think too many balls came my way. I was able to, yeah, yeah, I was able to save my dignity over there. And so they said, oh, this is good. Indians play football and they stand in one place in the goal. So let's get him for the next contest. So next contest, uh, that was a one-day tournament. They got me in. Uh, so here I'm standing in the goal and, uh, you know, this is 22-year-old 20, or 23-year-old French guy, solidly built, comes thundering down the right side, stops, and he stops about four feet in front of me and lets fly. And, uh, you know, his, his legs are built like logs. And it went bang. And um, you, know, you know what? The, goal, the ball didn't actually go into the goal because my head got in the way. Um, I took a big bang on my cheek. The ball bounced off. My head went into the goal. <laughs> but, 
you know they were very happy because uh, at the end of the day we won the tournament so, so i was able to you know work with them very closely um, after that because they trusted me uh, and they called me to every game every match uh, that we played regardless of the results then sensitivities different people have a way of interpreting different situations so i was talking to one of my friends and he was uh, narrating an instance that happened in marseille which is south of uh, france and by the way even though france is one country people in different parts of um, france behave differently so he went for dinner uh, good restaurant finished dinner got up and then and the restaurant owner came up and said so how was dinner he said ambience was good food was good service was a little slow so what would you expect the restaurant owner to respond with we would say you know we, we were in the place oh i'm so sorry sir we will take care of it and he said that's fine you can go to some other place tomorrow so he stunned he said what you know you asked me right you asked me about the place he said yes i can't do any better than this i suggest you find some other place tomorrow so in marse it's all about you know i don't care if i do business with you i want i am like this take it or leave it we will work from 9 to 5 or 9 to 6 this is our life which is not the same as uh, you know pari and uh, which is what the, the parisians call paris uh, in paris it's very different so the paris and the marseille folks hate each other's guts so if you go to marseille never tell them that you are coming from paris they will kill you or they won't do business with you or when you go to marseille just tell them you know these parisians they really don't do much anyway, i hope there's nobody in pa- uh, marseille actually watching this okay um when in rome do as romans this, this is something i learned the hard way this may be a little embarrassing for the ladies but i will go and narrate it anyway so the first yeah divakar knows what i'm about to say so the first time um i, I went abroad especially uh, since i play football uh, i went and played with one of uh, the uk teams and uh, after the game happens we're all sweaty tired obviously one can't go home like this Uh, you have to shower and change you go into the gym room and there is this bunch of 10 guys who played with you they stripped down bare minimum nothing and you are an indian you have your modesty right so you, you need to actually we uh, say okay let's wear shorts and do something and that's when we get out of place completely out of place for them it's nothing out of the ordinary and and i beg your pardon ladies so if it's offensive but this is something which uh, i learned no matter how embarrassing it is unless if we want to be seen as part of the group we've got to blend in so when you are in rome do as the romans do it got better over a period of time i just started closing my eyes and uh, you just have to keep uh, another good way is taking part in the local festivals working with people talking to people so all this shows that that we care so that creates the emotional uh, quotient between them now we know that english is a very simple language right now here is a simple definition of cricket for people who can't read it let me read it to you you have two sides one out in the field and one in each man that's in the side that's in goes out and when he is out he comes in and the next man goes in until he is out when they are all out the side that's out comes in and the side that's been in goes out and tries to get those coming in out sometimes you get men still in and not out when a man goes out to go in the men who are out try to get him out and when he is out he goes in and the next man in goes out and goes in there are two men called umpires who stay all out all the time and they decide when the men who are in are out when both sides have been in 
and all the men have been out and both sides have been out twice after all the men have been in including those who are not out that is the end of the game <laughs> now with, with a definition like this why would the person in the next slide not need help such a complex language um, I guess he needs help so um, there is a there's an organization which uh, helps expats when they move to new countries it's called uh, internations and internations has got about 300 chapters uh, across the world uh, in 300 cities uh, I got to know them in Paris and they do a fantastic job of getting people who are expats get to know the city that that you live in so uh, if and chennai has uh, an internations chapter as well which meets once a month they also have um, they they also have you know interest groups which one can join if necessary uh, and whenever you know once you get in there it's free there are two levels of membership one which is paid for and one which is free you can meet once every month you can get into self-interest and whenever you move uh, countries all you have to do is change your home city and you can get information about the chapter that's in the city you're moving to so internations.org is is that site so in in summary right it's um, Businesses are becoming global and, and we are interacting with a lot of people. Uh, successful companies focus on creating a br bridge uh, between the cultures. It's very important that we connect emotionally with the uh, people that we work with. And, um, you know, incidentally, Devakar uh, forwarded me something 
today, this morning, and that's, I, I took the liberty of putting um, that here, that such skills, which he calls code switching between cultures, is going to become a key part of the 21st century manager. It's the ability to understand and handle people who work as part of a global community, who work as part of a multicultural team. Uh, and this is going to be important. So, in, in summary, focusing, working with people, focus on the language, the local business, and business etiquette, and show that you care. Thank you very much. Uh, any questions? Except any embarrassing ones. That's true, ma'am. I agree. Any other questions? What is the most uh, difficult situation you have been in, other than the gym episode? <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that was an easy answer. Most difficult situation when, when dealing with people, you mean? I think it's it's been about um, there have been instances when I've applied my uh, knowledge of situations in India to to situations in France or in uh, you know German in Holland, not realizing that I'm I'm making a mockery of myself. But my most difficult was my first one in the U.S. Uh, because after that it was easy, making a fool of myself was very easy after that. But the first time was quite uh, difficult. So I went up to this McDonald's lady and uh, there's a big line behind me and she gets my order ready and she says, um, eat it or take out. And first time I'm listening, I said, uh, I said, excuse me? She says, eat it or take out. So can you please repeat that? She says, eat it or take out. I said, I still don't understand. Then she looked at me and said, this guy is an idiot. So, so she said, eat in or take out. Boy, I said, okay, I said, eat in. So that was pretty embarrassing because people around me were, were looking at me like I was an alien. Right? No, no one no, notes that you, know, you come from a country where there is no eat in or take out. It's only eat in. Maybe I think I'll have a last question to Sudhir. Sure, Gopal. Sudhir, did you, uh, before you travel to all these places, uh, did you meet somebody who had already gone and take some lessons on this or like you just experimented with this? With the US, yes. Uh, it's easy to do that. With the UK, yes. With France, no. There aren't too many Indians in France. Um, and even if they are, uh, many, many people, what they tend to do is because it needs knowledge of French, uh, they tend to be insular. They tend to stick to each other's communities and even after one or two years they don't understand the language nor do they go out with uh, French and therefore any you know learning in such circumstances comes from actually going there and experiencing it even though I took classes in French here until I went there I really didn't understand how certain words were pronounced that that was a learning thanks a lot Steve, for thank you for being patient listeners <laughs>